From the days of Dalmo through this century, martial arts has produced legends that endure to this day. Funakoshi Gichen, the grandmaster of karate that introduced the empty hand art to the outside world. Mas Oyama, the grandmaster of Kyoshu Shinkai. He duplicated the feet of Sasagawa by killing a 2,000 pound bull with his bare hands. Yamaguchi Gogen, the cat, was once captured by his enemies and placed in a cage with a tiger to scare information out of him. The tiger feared him. In the 40s and 50s, a new breed of masters started to emerge. It was Ed Parker, the father of modern day Kempo, and Mr. Bruce Lee, the innovator of Kung Fu, and the originator of Jeet Kune Do. Grandmaster Robert Tree is the founder of the United States Karate Association and the first man to hold a tournament in the U.S. Mr. Bill Superfoot Wallace and Mr. Joe Lewis, two pioneers of tournament competition as we know it today. Among those who fought along with yesterday's legends was one that seemed to have just vanished until now. This is a look at his journey through martial arts. James Cook was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1947 a thin, wiry child with very low confidence and often found himself being picked on by the school bullies. After watching a television martial arts demonstration by a gentleman named Ed Parker, he found what he considered a way to change his life, not knowing that this life change would take him around the world. At the age of 10, he was taking magic classes at a local recreation center when one day the teacher failed to show up. As he wandered through the center, he stumbled into a room where everyone was wearing white pajamas with different color belts around their waist. It was a judo class. The chief instructor, Mr. Bob Howard, would set him on a path that he still holds to this day. It was there that he studied Kodokan Judo and Shotokan Karate. James studied long and hard, sometimes walking five miles to get to classes. That was when they weren't on his side of town. It was a couple of years later that he met a former Marine by the name of Clifford Yates, who had just returned from Okinawa. A third down in Goju, Clifford moved like a cat. He had two students that he trained privately. There was Mr. Jake Lacey, a former military policeman that had spent several years in the military and had studied Taekwondo, but decided to expand his knowledge by studying with Clifford. Jake, too, had the moves of a cat and the speed of a bullet. Jake once said, you have four types of individual, those that can teach and cannot execute, those that cannot execute but can teach, those that cannot execute nor teach, and those that can execute and teach. Mr. Henry Story, the other student, had basically started from scratch, but due to his dedication and constant practice, he quickly excelled and became a formidable opponent for any street fight. Clifford's stay would be short as he missed the military and re-enlisted. That's when the three of them found Wally Culper, another former Marine that was teaching at the Ohio Judo and Karate Association in Cleveland. He taught Ishinu Karate and the training was anything but fun. Thirsting for all the knowledge that he could get, he found another school on his side of town. This was his first taste of Kung Fu. Master John Armstrong Custer taught Pak Mi Pai to a very close circle of students, but due to his perseverance, he was finally accepted as a student. In 1966, he awakened not only to the true meaning of martial arts, but the training that would test not only his body, but his very soul. It was no longer a sport or a game. This was Vietnam and it was real. Stationed in Phu Thai Valley outside of Quen Yan, he found himself across the river from the great Tiger Division, the most fierce fighters of the Korean Army. They did not practice a sport they trained to kill. While on duty one day, he met Corporal Jung, a Korean soldier that befriended him and invited him to train with them. Imagine, if you will, 1,000 white uniforms punching and kicking in sink in 120 degree heat at high noon, being coached by a gentleman standing on a two-story platform with two huge bullhorns blaring the count. When not on duty, he would swim across the shallow river to endure the training, which was hard and grueling. 
At 135 pounds, the heat would take its toll, but he endured and continued to train. Tiger Division had a staff of several of their highest ranking black belts whose only job was to rotate Korean Army troops through the unit for 30 days of intense training and then return them to their units ready for mortal combat. There were no gloves or pads, but there was plenty of blood and broken bones. It was there that he first met General Chel Hong Hee, the father of the modern day Taekwondo Association. It was also there that he started learning the Korean language which would serve him well in the future. In the middle of 1967, James returned to the U.S. to Fort Meade, Maryland, where he was an MP as well as the base instructor passing on the knowledge given to him. His students had no idea what they were in for. Being restless, he volunteered to go to Germany. While in traffic school in Garmisch, he met up with a group of German martial artists training on the base and was invited to join them. When they realized his background and training, he was offered a position to take over as head master of their school downtown. As fate would have it, he had just re-enlisted and had to decline the offer, which was later taken up by the master, Al Dacascus. He returned to Fort Meade for a brief stint and found himself about to embark on yet another excursion into the East in the birthplace of martial arts. It was his first day in Tegu, Korea, where he met Master Ku Muk Hue, a sixth down in Uruguay Taekwondo Karate. This was the man that would teach him to defy the laws of gravity and to fly. Taekwondo with its awesome kicks and sometimes acrobatic maneuvers would add even more to an already overflowing arsenal of techniques. It was here also that he would meet other great masters like Grandmaster Dong Ju Lee and Grandmaster Park Chul Hee. It was the first time he had seen padding for protection and the first time that he had his taste of sport competition. It was also under Ku's tutelage that he would begin to understand another avenue of his inner strength. After two years of continuous study, he returned to the U.S. to Fort Bragg, where once again, his talents were sought out by both military and civilian population. But once again, he knew there was more, so he re-enlisted to return to Korea. But he left behind two of his top students, Mr. Wilton Bennett and Mr. Jimmy Brown, to take over for him. He returned to Daegu, Korea for what would be close to the height of his journey. Jung Ho Ming was an English professor that taught Shi Pao Gi, or as we knew it, Kung Fu. His classes were held on the roof of a Chinese elementary school at the end of the airstrip. Due to his extensive background, he was to become the only American in a class of 20 or so students. Several months after joining the class, Mr. Ming was offered a lucrative job in China and left. The class disbanded and he found himself on a search for another Kung Fu teacher. It was a cool summer evening when he was introduced to Chun Guan Ho, a man that would introduce him to techniques and weapons that would only boggle the minds of those yet to know him. This powerful little man had the keys to so many things that James had been seeking. His ability to teach the use of the mind as well as the body was incredible. His knowledge and understanding of weaponry went far beyond any of those of his previous instructors. It was the system of praying mantis which Chun had trained in since the age of six. Once again, James would enter the world of learning to fly. 